Okay, hello everyone uh, and welcome to today's webinar uh, organized by Maudlin College Cambridge and Target Oxbridge. Um, and if you've been to one of our previous seminars, you'll know that uh, we've talked about the natural sciences and we've talked about engineering and this time uh, we're going to talk about maths, which is my subject, so I'm very happy about that. And I'm, uh, my name is Sergio Bacallado, and I'm the admissions tutor uh, for ACCESS at Maudlin College. Um, and I have two very special um, co-panelists today. So uh, we have Alexander Olive uh, from Target Oxbridge, and uh, Kayla Kadina Miller, who's uh, very graciously uh, joining us today from AstraZeneca. And uh, Kayla was a student at Cambridge and she graduated, um, was it two years ago, Kayla? Or? Yeah. So, uh, so she's, um, she's a recent graduate and um, she'll be able to give you more of a per the perspective of a student uh, in Cambridge. Um, and um, the way uh, the seminar will be structured is we, uh, I will give a brief talk, um, which is going to be partly about admissions and partly about, um, uh, it will be a, a taster lecture for university level maths. Um, and, um, and then after that, that should take about 30 or 40 minutes. And after that, you'll have a chance to ask any questions that you'd like to ask about admissions in mathematics, about admissions interviews, um, uh, or you know, any other aspect of the process that, that you have questions about. And so you're welcome to start thinking about those and you can submit them um, to us through the Q&A box, uh, which is one of the items in the menu uh, at the bottom of your screen. Um, we'll answer them after uh, the talk. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, share my screen with you. Um, Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. Um, so my talk today, as you can see, is titled Probability in the Real World. Um, but um, before I, I get into the taster lecture, I just wanna start on a, on a personal note about university admissions. And I wanna talk about um, my experience when I was applying to universities. Uh, and I guess I wanna start by with a game. So uh, this, this is a picture of the city where I'm from, and I want uh, to see if, can, if anyone can identify the city. I don't know if anyone's played this game before, but can you try to guess where the city is um, just from the picture? Okay, so if you, if you have any guesses, feel free to put them in the, in the chat box and um, we'll see if, you, if anyone is lucky. So somebody is, is guess Brazil. That's a very good guess. We have another vote for Brazil. Rio. <laughs> it does look a lot like Rio. That is, it's not Rio though. Uh, any other guess? Uh, Venezuela. Okay, it's bingo. So we have a winner. Uh, so uh, indeed, this is uh, Caracas. It's the capital city of Venezuela, and. Um, I was, you know, the next picture I was going to show you um, was, sorry, it seems that my, let me just briefly reshare because the connection seems to have dropped. Um, this was the next picture I was going to show you, which I think is maybe a more identifiable symbol of, of the country. Um, but um, but anyway, I am from Venezuela, and when I was applying to university, uh, you know, when you were very young, uh, I um, I had a friend. You know, I was going to a school in Venezuela where most people, you know, if they went to university, some people went to university, but most people went to universities in Venezuela. And um, I had a friend who had a crazy idea and suggested that 
uh, I applied to a university in a different country. And we decided to uh, apply to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. We were very enthusiastic uh, about studying science and maths in school, and we were very good at it. And we decided that we were going to try applying to <laughs> the MIT. And those of you who have heard of MIT, it's a very prestigious university in the United States. Um, and it was kind of a crazy choice because I didn't know anyone who had applied to MIT before. Um, there was nobody, certainly nobody in my school who had applied, who I knew who had applied to universities in, in the US. Um, but, um, you know, it, 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 it was actually a very good decision because I was lucky enough to, to get in. But if I had listened to many people around me, I, I would have probably not <laughs> applied. You know, I remember telling my brother that I was thinking of applying to MIT and he was one of the few people in my environment who had heard about it and he told me I was crazy, you know, I'm never gonna get in. And, you know, I, I thought, you know, there's, it's, I am not the kind of person who tends to go to MIT. There's no one from Latin America there. Um, and so, you know, there were many reasons not to apply, but luckily I was crazy enough to apply and I begged my mother to give me uh, uh, the money for the application fee, which, you know, at the time was a lot of money for someone making a Venezuelan salary. Um, and, uh, but you know it worked out well for me and so um i i was dumped into this university in america and of course it's a very nice university and i got a great education but part of a lot of what you get from going to a university where you're not the typical student is you get exposed to a very different kind of culture so you know i went to a dorm that looked my, my residence hall looked a bit like this and that was completely foreign to my culture and you know the students did things like putting trucks on tops of, on top on you know the top of a building or um, you know this gif that you're seeing is an actual somebody actually programmed the windows in a building to play tetris uh, so that's not computer generated it's an actual image um, and so i got exposed to a very different culture and i learned a lot of, about science and technology it was a wonderful experience and so, um, so this is all to say that you know, if you're if you're thinking about applying to a really competitive university like Cambridge, uh, uh, and you think you know I will not get in, um, I think that the biggest mistake that you can make is not applying because that will guarantee that you will not get in. And sometimes accidents happen, like it, they happen to me, and you know, uh, or. <laughs> And you get to to go to a wonderful place to university and so this talk is about maths at cambridge and um you know if you've read a little bit about mathematics in cambridge you'll know that there's a very long tradition uh, of maths in the university and there's um you know very famous people i'm sure everyone is familiar with this fellow uh stephen hawking um and you know it's the, there are all the beautiful buildings and all the history but really what makes maths uh, at Cambridge uh, so special is the people who work in the maths faculty and the students who go to Cambridge who are all extremely enthusiastic and, and very smart and, and diverse and, and they make it a very engaging place. And one aspect of our teaching system is we have supervisions, okay, which are um, very personalized uh, sessions where a student gets, uh, usually it's two students who work with a faculty member or a PhD student uh, to work through their, their weekly homeworks. And, and if you walk into our maths faculty, which is the, the building that I'm showing in this picture, you'll normally, you'll see a, a, it's a big room full of tables. And if you walk the, in there on any given afternoon, you'll find um, a couple dozen groups of people getting supervision. And so it's it's really a very stimulating environment. And as I said, you know, we have some very faculty, some very famous faculty members. So these two guys here are Fields medalists. The, you know, this is a very prestigious honor in, in, in mathematics. And um, and 
you know, if you're if you're interested in maths, uh, this lady, her name is Holly Krieger. Um, she's uh, a lecturer in the department, and she's she has a wonderful set of videos uh, on popular maths, and you can see them in the YouTube channel number file. So this will give you a taste of the kind of people who work in the faculty, and and this is really what makes uh, Cambridge so exciting. Okay, so um, so this is just you know a bit of motivation just to tell you apply to Cambridge, but um, what I want to do today is give you a short lecture uh, that will give you a taste of university level maths because university level maths is, is kind of different from the maths that you see in school. Okay, it goes into more depth. You try to, to uh, prove results rather than apply uh, more sort of computational or mechanical reasoning. Um, and um, it's something that um, if, you, if, you, if you have a taste of university level maths, uh, I think you have a better appreciation of what it'll, what it'll be like uh, to work as a mathematician and the kinds of doors that mathematics can, can open. Okay, so the talk today is about probability in the real world. And I thought I would uh, start by discussing a, an application uh, as an example, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, right? Which is a very important current problem today. And, a lot of people might have heard that um, COVID-19, in COVID-19, the number of, uh, of infections grows exponentially, okay? So at least in the beginning, before there was any kind of control measure, uh, before there, were, there was social distancing, you know, so think about what was happening around March, um, the number of people who were infected was growing like an exponential curve. So what is an exponential curve? So it looks like this. So if you have a time in the y in the x-axis and the number of people who are infected at a given time point on the y-axis, um, the this grows as a function which is f of x equals e to the r times x. Okay, and if you've seen an exponential, you know that what defines it is that uh, points that are separated, that are spaced um, by a, a, an equal interval on the x-axis. So if we think of, of these four points, x1, x2, x3, and x4, and you assume that the, the interval between them is equal, and we'll call the interval delta t, then um, the corresponding y values, y1, y2, y3, and y4, uh, any any pair of consecutive values will be multiplied times a constant. Okay, so uh, let's do a little calculation here. So if we have that y1 is equal to e to the um, um, r times x1, okay, and we think about what is y2. So y2 is equal to e to the r times x2. Um, but x2 we know is equal to x1 plus delta t, right? Because uh, so x2 here is equal to x1 plus delta t. And so if we substitute that here, we get that this is equal to e to the r times x1 plus delta t. And um, those of you who have seen exponentials will know that if you have e to the something plus something, um, that is equal to e to the r x1 times e to the r times delta t. Okay, um, so this is just a, a property of the exponential. If you have sums in the exponent, you can split it into factors. Um, you can split it into a product. Um, and so e to the r x1 is equal to y1, so this is y1 times e to the r times delta t, okay? And by the same reasoning, if you write uh, y3, you can show that it is equal to y2 times e to the r times delta t, and y4 is equal to y3 times e to the r times delta t, okay? So every time we move uh, by a constant amount on the x-axis, we are increasing by a constant factor in the x-axis. And so 
Um, so the gaps in the x-axis will become, in the y-axis, will become bigger and bigger. Okay, so uh, this gap is much bigger than this gap, which is bigger than this gap. Okay. Um, Okay, so where does this idea of an exponential come from in, in an epidemic? Well, it's actually not too difficult to, to understand that. So if you start with one person who's infected, and let's assume that each person infects two other people. Okay, so, um, so the first person infects two people, and each of these people infect two people. And each of these people infect two people. Okay, and then we count the number of people who are infected at each time point. We have um, that at the first time point we have one, okay, and we can write that, we, we can write that as two to the power of zero, okay, so this is one person. In the second generation we have two people, which is two to the power of one. In the third generation we have four people, which is two to the power of two. In the third generation, we have eight people, which is two to the power of three, okay? And so this is, we can see that uh, we can write, uh, so, you know, in, in general, after our generations, so after uh, our uh, generations, uh, we have, or actually let's use a different letter here, so let's say, after um, Z generations, we have uh, two to the power of Z um, infected people. And this is, uh, you can write this as um, so two to the power of Z is equal to E to the logarithm um, um, of two, or let's actually use the natural logarithm, let's see, the logarithm of two times z. And so you see that the growth is again an exponential function, okay? Um, and here, uh, logarithm of two is the, what we were calling r before, okay? And so what happens that in, in the real world, actually it's not the case that each person infects two people, right? Each person will infect a random number of people. So if we need, if we want to understand how the number of people who are infected um, grows in time, we need to understand this as a random quantity. We need to talk about probabilities. And so what we're gonna focus on is understanding the distribution of the number of uh, so the number of people that say I get the disease, the number of people that I infect will be a random variable. And we're going to try to understand what the distribution of this random variable is. Okay. So how many people does each person with COVID-19 infect? And we're going to consider a very simple model. So say that Paul has a, a disease. And in each second in the day, Paul has some small chance of infecting someone else, okay? And we can model uh, this, uh, this, this event as a coin toss, okay? So in each second in the day, um, Paul will flip a coin, and if it comes up heads, then he will pass the disease to a new person. If it comes up tails, then he doesn't transmit the disease during that second. So let's introduce some notation for this. So N, capital N is the number of coin tosses, the number of seconds in the day. P is the probability of an infection at each one. Okay, so normally when we toss a coin, we think of the probability of heads as one, as one half. But now we're gonna assume that the probability of heads is some constant, which is P. Okay, so it could be a, a coin that's a little wonky and maybe it has a higher chance of coming up heads versus tails. And X will be the total number of infections that happen during the day, okay? The total number of heads that we get in all our coin tosses. Okay, so um, I should say, you know, this, is, this doesn't sound like a very realistic model, right? That 
in each second in the day, you have the same chance of infecting, of passing the disease onto someone else. But maybe in some situations it could be realistic. Okay, so think about if if you're talking about a period of time when Paul is um, um, maybe he works in a supermarket and uh, he interacts with people constantly, and so at each maybe not each second, but you know each period of ten minutes, he has some chance of interacting with someone and maybe he unfortunately passes on the disease. Okay, and so. Um, what is the probability that we have eye infections? Okay, so the way that this is defined, we, we write it this way, we say P of X equals I, so the probability that the number of infections equals I is the sum over all outcomes that lead to eye infections of the probability of the outcome I. Okay, so this the symbol means a sum and we are adding up the sum of all outcomes that lead to eye infections. So what is an outcome? An outcome is simply a sequence of coin tosses, okay? And so I'm gonna represent the sequence, which is length N, because remember capital N is the number. Oh, I'm so sorry, I think my, my screen is frozen. Let me um, reshare. Um, Okay, so this this is uh, this is making more hopefully more sense now. So, what an outcome, as I was saying, is a, a sequence of coin tosses, and um, in this case, so we I'm drawing you know a sequence zero zero one one zero one. So what this means is in the first period, uh, Paul did not pass the disease. In the second, he did not. In the third, we had an infection. In the fourth, we had an infection. In the fifth, no infection. Okay, so this is a specific ordering of infections versus non-infections. Okay, so this is what we call an outcome W. And each outcome has a, a certain probability. And we call that probability P of W. Okay, and so what is the probability of having eye infections? It is the sum over all outcomes which have eye infections or eye ones of the probability of the outcomes. Okay, and so actually the num the probability of a specific outcome that has eye infections is something that we can calculate. Okay, so the probability of the sequence W, which has eye infections, is equal to every time we need to basically the, the coin needs to come up come up heads i times and it needs to come up tails uh, n minus i times so the, the chance that it comes up heads is p and so we have p to the power of i because we need to have i factors of p and uh, 1 minus p uh, to the power of n minus i because we need n minus i times when um, we have no infection. So notice here that we're multiplying the probabilities, right? So this is because we're thinking of each coin toss as independent. So the way you uh, compute the probability of a specific sequence of, of, out, of, of you know, zeros and ones is you multiply the probability of each one. Okay, so this is the formula for uh, P of uh, W here. So this, uh, um, summoned. And then we have to add up, um, to get the probability of eye infections, we add up um, this probability um, for all the outcomes that have eye infections, right? Because there are many sequences of zeros and ones that have exactly eye ones. There are many ways of ordering the ones. Um, but all of the, all of, all of the summons are exactly the same. And so um, the probability that x equals i is p of w, which is what we have here. And this number counts the number of ways in which we can have i exactly i ones in a sequence of length n. Okay, and this is something that you that you read n choose i. 
Okay, so that's the number of sequences with exactly i ones and n minus minus i zeros, and it has this formula. So for those of you who haven't seen this, and when I write n with a with a bang after with an exclamation sign, that means n factorial. So this is n times n minus one times n minus two, all the way to one. Okay, and and this is the formula for n choose i. So I, this, um, so we we get um, this expression uh, for um, the the probability uh, of having exactly i infections, and we say that this is a, a by that x the number of infections is a binomial distribution. So if we draw the probability um, that x equals i. And here we draw we draw i the number of points. We know that the the number of infections is between zero and n, and each number in between, so one, two, three, etc., will have some probability. And the way that this distribution looks like is something like this. Okay, the center of the distribution um, will be around uh, p times n. Okay, so this is called a binomial distribution. And so now let's suppose that there are many, many opportunities to pass on the virus. So we're the, the number of um, you know, time periods or seconds that we're looking at n is very, very large. And on the other hand, the probability that we pass the virus on at each opportunity is very, very small. It's vanishingly small, okay? So in maths, the way we write that is as follows. So we, are, we can model uh, the probability of an infection as some constant lambda divided by n, and we let n go to infinity, okay? And so this means that we're assuming that n, the number of, of opportunities to pass on the virus is very, very large. It's growing to infinity. So that's what I mean by this n with an arrow to infinity. And uh, p, the probability of passing the virus, will be some constant divided by n. So when n is very large, p will be very, very small. Okay? And so there's this result that is that um, is called the law of rare events, which tells us that if p is lambda divided by n for some constant lambda, okay, so you can think of lambda as one or two, for example, when the number of trials n becomes very, very large, then the probability of having exactly i event infections has this formula, or it is very, very close to this formula, okay? so. Again, here in the denominator, we have i factorial. So that's um, what I described before. So that's i times i minus one times i minus two, all the way to one. Okay, so wh where does this formula come from? Right? This is uh, what we're gonna try to answer now. By the way, this is called the Poisson distribution, which Poisson means fish in French, but it is not this type, this is not what it's named after. It's named after this fellow. And a Poisson distribution looks a bit like this. So if we have um, P of X equals I in the Y axis and in the X axis we have I. Now this is a distribution over all the integers, zero, one, two, three, all the way to infinity. And it looks something like this. It's a bit like a binomial, but now we have little sticks that extend all the way to infinity. And the center of the distribution is around lambda. Okay, so if we look at the center of the distribution, lambda is around here somewhere. Okay, so let's try to prove um, this equality. So we, this was the formula that we derived before for the binomial distribution. We know that this is the, the actual formula for the probability that x equals i. And so we can write this out a little bit. So what I've done here is I've basically written out the, the factorials. 
n for n and n minus i factorial. And I've plugged in the expression that we're assuming for p, which is lambda divided by n. And that's it. That's all I've done so far. And then if we manipulate this a little bit, so we take this lambda to the power of i and we write it here, okay? And then um, we split this factor into these two factors. And then we cancel some terms in the numerator and the denominator, we get this new formula. And from this formula, we can prove that this is, this, uh, when n is very large, this is around um, what we're trying to prove, which is this expression for the Poisson distribution. Okay, so what I have in this box will be very close uh, to this expression when n is very large. So let's prove that. So I'm going to call uh, this factor A, this factor B, and this factor C. And we're going to show the following. We'll show that A is converges to 1 as n goes to infinity. So this notation, what this means is that when n is very, very large, A will go very, very, very close to 1. And the larger we make n, the closer it gets to one. Okay, so we can make it actually arbitrarily close, as close as we want to one, by making n larger and larger. Okay, this is called a limit. And b, um, the factor b will converge to e to the minus lambda, and the factor c will converge to one as n goes to infinity. And so this implies that the, the product of these factors converges to lambda to the power of i divided by i factorial times e to the minus lambda, which is the Poisson distribution. It's what we want. Okay, so um, let's see. So a is, we can write um, the product a in this way, right? So I've simply split n to the power of i into n factors of uh, i factors of n in the denominator. And if you think about each one of these factors, we have n or n minus something divided by n. Okay? But whatever we subtract, for example, i plus 1, you can think of as fixed. And then you make n grow as, as large as possible. right? So this means that um, the numerator and the denominator will start looking very close to each other. Okay? Um, and in fact, each of these factors converges to one. Okay? So when you multiply a, a bunch of things, each of which is converging to one, you get uh, something that converges to one. Okay? So this converges to one because each factor approaches one as n goes to infinity. Now, um, if you look at uh, the factor C, okay, so this factor here, um, this is 1 minus lambda divided by n to the power of minus i. Um, and as n goes to infinity, lambda divided by n uh, becomes vanishingly small. And so this approaches 1 to the power of minus i, which is equal to 1. And finally, uh, the last factor is the trickiest one. So this factor is 1 minus lambda to the uh, divided by n to the power of n. And how does this behave as n goes to infinity? It's hard to say because this here is going to zero, right? When n is very large, lambda divided by n becomes a, a very, very small. But then we're raising this to a power which goes very, very high. Okay, so um, how do we analyze it? So we're going to use a technique called Taylor series. And this is something that you'll learn when you study calculus. So many of you won't have seen this before. And what this is, is a way of writing functions as infinite sums, as an infinite sum of, uh, of polynomials, an infinite polynomial. 
Okay, so for example, the function e to the minus lambda can be written as this particular infinite sum, one minus lambda divided by one factorial plus lambda squared divided by two factorial minus lambda to the power of three divided by three factorial, et cetera. And so this is a, a formula which you can show is equal to e to the minus lambda. And there's a similar formula for the function that we're trying to study, so factor b, um, which is this one. And so if we compare the two formulas for e to the minus lambda and one minus lambda over n to the power of n, we see that um, the only difference is that in the, in the bottom formula, we have these factors. But by the same reasoning that we used in part A, each of these factors is going to converge to one as n goes to infinity. And so um, the, the formula that we have in the bottom becomes closer and closer to the formula we have uh, at the top, okay? And so this means that one minus lambda to the power of n converges to e to the minus lambda. And this is the last thing that we were trying to show. Okay, so that is how you prove this result, which is the law of uh, small probabilities. Okay, so I'll show you the, the, or the law of rare events. And what this shows you is, is that a binomial distribution in this limit when you have many, many trials and the probability of an infection at each trial is very, very small, it has this specific form, which is the Poisson distribution. Okay, so this is where um, I think the, the, the technical part of the talk will end. I'll just finish by saying that this theorem can be extended to models that have um, many trials, um, each, with a small, uh, each with a small chance of success, uh, of success, but maybe the trials are not completely independent, okay? Um, so maybe um, you can make the probability that, um, so for example, you know, if you have, coincidences, right? So if you think about the number of, you know, when you meet someone, what is the chance that you are, um, that you share, that, that you share a birthday and your parents share a birthday and your grandparents share a birthday? That's a very small probability. And when you look at a very large group of people, there are many possible pairs, each with a small chance of having this type of coincidence. And when you add up the, the number of coincidence in the set, those events are not independent, but the number of coincidences can have a Poisson distribution, okay? And you can have, for example, uh, in, the, in the infection example, that maybe the chance of passing the virus on at different times of day is not exactly the same, um, but you can still have this type of Poisson distribution. Okay, and so because of this, uh, this is just to say you can generalize the theorem that I, that I proved. You can weaken the assumptions. Um, it holds in, in, in more situations than the one that I described. And because of this, the Poisson distribution is everywhere in the real world. So for example, if you're working maybe for a company that, maybe you're working for Amazon or or you're working, um, you're, you're managing a call center and you want to estimate the number of customers that are arriving in a certain time, okay? So maybe you're, you're planning a shift of six hours and you want to know how many customers will, will arrive at each hour. Well, very frequently the distribution of that number is Poisson because you can think of it, there's always a small chance that for each second during that period, um, a customer will arrive, and the chance that it, this happens in separate periods is more or less independent. Okay, so if you're trying to uh, estimate, for example, you, maybe you want to have enough workers in your call center or in your in your warehouse, where you're, or you know, any kind of service uh, company that that needs to be staffed by people, you want to make sure that the staff 
um, that you have enough staff so that nobody's waiting for too long, but you don't want to have too many uh, employees at any given time because then you're, you know, you would be, you would have people who don't have anything to do. And so the way you can you can understand this is you can look at uh, the tails of this distribution, right? So this will tell you the probability that you have more than a certain number of people arriving. Uh, at a queue uh, at a given time. So this is actually a very big area of studies and it's called uh, uh, queuing models, okay? So it's, but trust me, it's like much more interesting to study queues than it is to wait in queues. <laughs> it's it's, a, it's a, a very interesting area. Okay, so the Poisson distribution is everywhere in the real world. And in particular for, for this application of infections, and I'm not going to go any further today because I, I want to leave time for the Q&A, um, but let's return for a moment to um, our example of, of COVID-19. So if you think of an infection tree, you know, the way people pass the disease to, to each other, now we can think of the number of people that each person infects as a random variable. So maybe we have a person here who doesn't infect anyone, but this person infects three people. And so actually, if you think of the number of people who each of the, the, the each, each person in generation two infects, so if you think of generation two, we will have a number of people there and each one of them will pass the disease to a number of people. And if we assume that each person passes the, the disease to a Poisson, distributed number of people. Okay, so each, each person will pick a random number um, and all of them are Poisson. Actually, the sum of these variables is also Poisson. And so you can start to understand um, the distribution of uh, the growth of, of the epidemic because the growth of the epidemic is never something deterministic like this exponential that I've drawn. It's always something that fluctuates randomly around it. And so you can try to understand um, the probability that different, that the curve will behave in certain ways, okay? Um, so this, I hope this has given you just a, a taste of how you apply probabilistic thinking in the real world. Um, and in fact, probability is one of the areas of mass that has the most applications and it's one that's uh, dear to my heart. Um, and, uh, and I think I'll leave it, uh, there. Okay. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the Q and A as well. Okay. So, um, so I'm going to, uh, stop sharing my screen. It, okay. It seems we haven't lost too many people. So I'm glad, um, uh, you, you, uh, were able to bear with me. Um, and so, um, I, it seems we have, um, we already have one question, okay? So um, let's, uh, let's answer. So somebody asks, I have just started year 12, but I'm confused as to when I should start step preparation. So what is an ideal time to start, okay? So, I mean, I would say that um, if you're in, maybe you know from the very start of year 13 you should be preparing for for step definitely but there are many things that you can do even in year 12 or in the summer of year 13 to prepare for the exam okay even if you're not studying the specific topics that will appear in step you can try to um challenge yourself with problems that go perhaps a little bit beyond what you're looking at in school Okay, so there are a couple of resources that are very useful. Um, so there's a website called Enrich Maths. So it's, uh, um, it's N, uh, I'll actually type it into the chat box. So it's N Rich. Um, and that has uh, a lot of problems that are designed to complement uh, the material that you study in your A-levels um, and AS-levels. Um, and that's a, an excellent an excellent resource to use if you find that you know you maybe you try a step problem and 
you don't necessarily have the background to tackle it yet. I don't know if uh, maybe Kayla will have some some input on this because I know that you've been through this. Um, yeah, so um, I, I actually, my school told me to start studying for STEP once I'd passed the interview. So they gave us a little bit less time, um, but that was okay as well. And I, I fully um, encourage you as well to look at maths um, outside of what you do at school because it's really rich. And even with the maths you do at school, you can solve some really interesting problems. One of the things that's really different about STEP compared to maths you do at school is that each take question takes about half an hour um, and that might sound like a really long time but it it feels like the right amount of time when you're doing a step question so getting used to a maths problem that takes that amount of time um, is I think a good thing to do okay um, and in terms of the material that step covers I mean is this something that you could you potentially start before you do your interview uh, uh, yeah, because there's also step one as well as step two and three. So step one you can do with maths that you learn in year 12. Um, and you, you would normally take that at the end of year 12. Um, I don't know if they've changed step at all since I applied. Is that still the case? Yes, I, I mean, I think that's still the case for step one. And, and, um, there's, um, I mean, I guess an, uh, something else, to, another way to think about it is you have if you if you prepare for step earlier, it can also help you in your interview, right? So if you're invited to interview, um, you know, doing step problems uh, will help you be a bit faster during the interview, which is always a good thing. Um, and I'm not sure how much it will help you directly with interview, but something I really enjoyed doing uh, when I was in my first year and deciding what to study at university is to read like the introduction or first chapter of some first like some like university level books so I, I didn't understand anywhere near enough to understand the main book but just like reading the description of how the author described the subject and what you could do with it was really eye-opening for me in terms of what maths could do and the different flavors of maths out there so I'd encourage you to do that like um, if you go on to something like uh, I'll type in like um, like maths overflow, math overflow for example and look for the book recommendations um, People have some really interesting things to say about maths books that inspire them. Yeah, you can also, you know, visit the the website of some. So normally, most universities for their first year courses, they will publish uh, schedules or syllabus um, with some book recommendations too. So I think that's a very good suggestion. Um, okay, so. Um, do we need any work experience to apply for maths at Cambridge? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that's uh, that's very important for maths. There are some subjects like medicine where, um, at least on, in normal years, uh, work experience is considered very important. But um, for maths, it isn't. Although, if you have done work, if you have worked, you know, in the summer, I think it, it's something that you could mention in your in your personal statement. Um, um, so is step one cancelled this year? Um, that's, I'm not quite sure about it. I mean, I know that for maths, we definitely require step two and three. That, that's what the conditions are, are based on. Um, I, I'm not, so this, that's why I'm not sure that, and I, I'm certain that step uh, two and three are not cancelled. Um, but I, I haven't heard anything about step one, so I, I hesitate to, to answer that uh, before I know it, but um, I can give you a link. So if you, um, um, so an excellent resource for preparing for step is uh, the website at the university and it is maths.org slash step. And if you go to, um, um, this page, um, so I'll, I'm sorry, I just realized that I'm uh, sending messages to all panelists, <laughs> not attendees, so, sorry, so, um, 
So maths, um, Okay, so I, I just sent two links. So maths.org slash step is a link to the, the university's preparation site for, for step and that will have a lot of problems with recent solutions and um, you know, model uh, exams from previous years. And so it's a very good resource. And um, the page for undergraduate study at Cambridge um, has a section called entry requirements and um, within that you know there you'll be able to find up-to-date information about step okay and, and you know it'll be it'll have the most updated information about what's happening in this very unusual year um, so what what are the average a level grades for math students who attend cambridge not referring to the entry requirements, but the actual grades achieved and how many A levels. Uh, so how many A levels do the average student, uh, the average student do? So I, um, I would say, I mean, the most important thing is really the, the typical offer, which is uh, two A stars and one A. Um, that said, you know, not everyone in in Cambridge gets that that grade some people there are uh, cases where people maybe get an A star AA um, it's hard to say I'm not, I don't know what the average uh, would be um, but I think maybe it's best to think about um, you know your goal should be meeting the condition which is an A star A star A um, and for maths, uh, another question is, you know, is further ma maths uh, critical? And it is highly recommended. Um, okay, so if you are in year 12 and you're thinking about whether and you're thinking of studying maths, definitely try to take further maths if it is offered at your school. But that said, you know, we are aware that it isn't offered in every school. And so it is not a, something that would disqualify your application. Um, okay, do you have any more interview tips? So maybe this is some more, something where Kayla might um, have some, some input. Um, so I would say um, practice speaking maths to someone. I think that's the weirdest thing about interviews because we're used to doing it or writing it down, um, whereas interview is really communicating with the interviewer about how you solve the problem. They'll give you some hints about how to go next and you really need to be able to voice your thinking process that, so that they can see how you learn and how you think um, because the interview is actually quite similar to a supervision in a supervision you have um, one like PhD student or professor and you and maybe one or two other pupils and they're ex giving you hints and tips to guide you forwards um, and you're, you're supposed to kind of take that on and kind of realize how to solve the problem so an interview is like very similar um, and so it's a good idea to try and find someone else, maybe in your maths class or a maths teacher, um, and kind of explain how you solved a problem. Um, or if it's a maths teacher, maybe you could even pick a hard problem that you couldn't solve and ask them to give you a hint um, and practice working it out out loud. I think that would be my biggest interview tip. Yeah, you, you should remember that the it's, it's a very good idea to start by watching some of the videos with uh, model interviews from the university. So there are some videos where there's, there's definitely a natural sciences interview and the, it's, it's quite similar to a maths interview in structure. And so one of our, if you, if you look at the video, you'll see that yeah, the, the, the way the interview works is you're asked questions, but we don't expect you to solve every problem independently. Right? You're supposed to, if you, you're so, in fact, we want to challenge you to the point where you'll be stuck. And so what we want to see is how you respond to that. If you, if you can say, if you can explain your argument verbally and maybe why you are stuck, maybe you tried something that didn't quite work and then maybe one of your interviewers will give you a hint and then you'll take that on and, and continue. And so as Kayla said, if you have, if you're able to practice that with a teacher or you know, a fellow student in your school, that, that can be very helpful. I think um, 
for for maths interviews, uh, I think you can probably classify the problems. Uh, I mean, you know, every every college asks a different set of questions, and every year the questions are different. But I think you can always expect to find some kind of graphing question, right? So you're given a function, and you have to draw the plot of the function. Um, and so, you know, try to challenge yourself with that type of problem. Uh, maybe it is a function that is uh, a polynomial, right? So, or maybe it is a ratio of two polynomials. So you have, you know, uh, x squared minus one divided by x plus three times x plus four, something like that. So if you come up with many examples like that and you work through them and you try to vocalize it, that, that will help you. Another um, type of problem that's very common is uh, something that uses the method of induction, so proof by induction, trying to find examples of problems that use proof by induction and thinking about how you might explain it aloud if you were uh, presented with a problem like that in an interview, that, that's, that can be very helpful. Is your college, for example, interview questions for maths, Sophia, or? Sorry? Do they put um, sample interview questions online? Mm, that's a very good question. It would be it would be a useful thing, but I, I'm... Yeah, I think, so I think um, I applied to Trinity and I remember finding Trinity sample interview questions online. So okay. um, have a search, some colleges might have them available. Yeah, and I think even if they're not published by the college, you might be able to source them from just the internet. There may be forums where people post interview style questions and that's definitely a way to prepare. And so if you can get a bank of questions together and then work through them with a teacher or something, that's a great way to prepare. So what, what kind of super curricular activities do you suggest we do? Um, very good question. So, so what's important to remember is that in Cambridge, we're mostly interested about academic super curriculars. So, you know, if you do things like athletics or music or, you know, maybe you, um, um, you have worked part time during some of your studies, those are all great things that you can include in your personal statement. But um, the things that will really help you during admissions are things that show that you have um, invested some time working in your subject and exploring your subject. So any reading that you've done on maths, any talks that you've attended um, on, about maths, or even you know, things like working through problems in some of these websites like Enrich Maths or maybe the UK Maths Challenge. Um, uh, that's another uh, organization that has a very good set of questions in the internet. So if you Google a UK MT uh, challenge, um, you can find questions dating back several years. And so if you if you can say in your statement, so I can't help you with that at the moment. Sorry, if you can um, if you can um, show that you've worked through some of these problems, okay, and and maybe you can explain in your personal statement what you found interesting about a problem that maybe made you want to learn um, maths at university. Um, that's the kind of thing that, that impresses an admissions tutor, okay? Um, so can you recommend any good maths books? I guess that I should answer. I will, I will say I'm always slightly nervous um, giving people book recommendations for everything, anything because tastes vary so much. Um, but something that's a good like general one, like um, even if you don't know much maths is the books by Simon Singh. So like he's got one on like maths and the Simpsons that I know that lots of people who even haven't studied maths find very interesting. And it's about the sort of pure maths that you get at a university level or higher. Um, then a book that inspired me a lot, but um, I only understood a little bit of was on numbers and games, <laughs> um, which is a book that shows that any number can be seen as a game um, and is very much in the flavor of university level maths in that you start with some simple rules and then you big, build up much more complex ideas from that. Um, but I think really you can be guided by um, your interests. Any maths book is a good maths book, in my opinion. Um, 
a weird recommendation is uh, I, I happen to study Russian at school. And if you want to get really, really good at differentiating things and integrating things, search online for a Russian book on <laughs> differentiation and integration. They have hundreds and hundreds of practice problems, which are much harder than the ones you get at school, but use the same mathematics. So three very different recommendations for you there. But also, um, as was mentioned, it might be worth looking on a college website or like reading lists if you want more ideas. If you search like maths university book list, um, they'll have some suggestions. I, I agree. I mean, I would tend to recommend books that are fun because you have to be engaged, right? And it's always easier when it's a problem that, that has some kind of interest for you so you know don't read a book that you find boring switch to a new book and if you um I've, i think yeah the, the simon singh book about the simpsons is a good one there's another one called for matt's last theorem which is more of a history book and it can give you a different perspective but it doesn't have the same kind of problem element um there's a book about uh mathematical uh, magic tricks that i think is really good so you can, it's called Magical Mathematics. Um, and if you can find it in a library, I think it's, it's worth checking out. Um, okay, so do the panelists all study maths and how is it, what is it like at uni compared to A-levels? Okay, so that's a, a great question for Kayla. So maybe, maybe I could, now would be a good time for Kayla to tell us a bit about her experience at Cambridge, but also a little bit about what it's what your life has been like after Cambridge and what kind of value you have taken from a math degree. Yeah, sure. So I think first of all, studying anything at uni is quite different to school because you move away from home, uh, you're in a new environment, you meet lots of people, um, and you're doing one subject uh, for most of the day. Um, so I think the biggest difference you realize quite quickly can compared to maths at A-levels is that things that you considered pure at A-levels are certainly considered applied at university. Maths can get a lot, lot more abstract than what we're used to. You get um, introduced to lots of weird objects like groups and rings and, um, and you're given just like these set of kind of definitions and then you build up the whole world from there. Um, I think also, um, you know, you're suddenly in a community of people who also study maths. Uh, so there's the opportunity there to have all of those conversations. There's lots of societies that do maths talks. Um, and in fact, some of them not even geared towards students. Um, there's an amazing institute at Cambridge, for example, uh, called the Isaac Newton Institute, where researchers get together to talk about particular mathematical themes. Um, and there further, you can see how big maths is. You get things on maths in the courtroom, you get things on maths in biology in the brain. Um, and so I think maths in university is a lot, lot more broad uh, than what I think I even imagined at A-levels. Um, and in terms of what my life has been like since then, I think, um, my current job, for example, I work in machine learning, in particular in natural language processing. So that's where we basically teach computers to get valuable information out of text. Um, and that um, studying maths was really valuable just because I didn't know anything about the field when I walked in. Um, but they hired me because they asked me, how would you solve this text classification problem? And I just used some ideas from maths and they were like, wow, amazing. <laughs> and I think that's one of the things maths gives you as um, you were just shown about how probabilities could help you look at the way diseases spread and get some useful information about it. There are so many ideas in mathematics that you can apply to many other problems. Like you can treat text as a graph or as a set of numbers and having that mathematical toolkit is immensely valuable. Thank you. So this actually connects very well with another question that says, what can we do with a maths degree? Right? So I think people do all sorts of things with maths degrees. So you can work in 
industry uh, in all sorts of industries and so in, um, engineering for example people there's a great need for people who uh, know how to do optimization and operations research um, you can work in machine learning or statistics within a company um, you can work in the financial industry so mathemati mathematics just gives you tools that allow you to tackle all, all sorts of problems in the real world. You don't necessarily gain a lot of knowledge about any specific field, but uh, every company always wants to hire mathematicians because they have ways of abstracting problems and analyzing them um, that many scientists don't really understand. Um, and you can also, of course, work in academia. You can work going to teaching. Um, there, it's a very, very uh, flexible degree and it opens a great number of doors. So it's, a, I think, a, and in fact, I, I've read somewhere that mathematicians rank among the highest, uh, the happiest people with their, their jobs after college. And I think part of the reason is it gives you so much choice and you can sort of choose what, what is best for you. Um, I don't know if there's anything you would like to add. Okay, I don't know what your colleagues from, from Cambridge ended up doing, what would you say? Um, so yeah, there's a huge variety of things. I think also like what um, a few people went on to do research in other subjects. So I know a lot of people got into like computer science and economics and are doing research there along with graduates of that subject. Mm -hmm. And also actually quite a few people who've gone on to do like completely different things. Like um, I know someone who's gone into marketing, some people who've gone into social policy and yeah i think they, they they all find the mathematical brain quite useful because we quite like understanding things clearly and i think that's useful anyway <laughs> good so then um the next question is what is a typical maths interview like at cambridge um so i mean i would say typically you get two interviews uh, so each interview is with a different set of two people and the way it works is um, there's not a lot of uh, talk at the beginning you go straight into the problem so you you know you'll greet your interviewers and they'll give you uh, they'll explain the the format of the interview and they'll give you a problem and so you know the problem will be written in a piece of paper in front of you and then you're supposed to work through uh, the problem and what, again, what we want to see is for you to vocalize your reasoning. So it's not a, a good idea to, um, you know, write a lot uh, without, you know, stopping to explain what you're doing or, or, or maybe spending too much time thinking, right? So if, you, if you're stuck, you're encouraged to ask questions of your interviewer. So maybe you say, um, you know, I'm trying to, use this approach but i don't think it works because of something because you know there's something unusual about this problem so they'll give you a hint about it and they'll allow you to that'll allow you to continue working through the problem and when you finish a problem you're t immediately given a new one and it goes on like that for about 25 minutes um and uh i so you know, the, the num each person will do a different number of problems. Normally you're given um, pro problems in, in an increasing level of, of difficulty. So you'll start with a problem that maybe is something like a graphing problem that is slightly more mechanical, maybe closer to the kinds of things that you're, you've done at school. And maybe you'll be introduced to more and more difficult challenges and so the idea is that even a very very strong student will eventually encounter a problem that they'll, that they'll find difficult um kayla i don't know what your experience was interviewing at cambridge you know what yeah i, I think i think that just describes it um really well and um i i remember being like scared of the interviewers obviously but they were they were very very friendly um, <laughs> And um, like I made some very like silly mistakes during my interview. For example, I got like positive and negative gradient mixed up. But like, you know, the people there really want to see you shine, and they're really like supportive when, and trying to make you feel comfortable. So um, that's what I remember the most. Yeah. 
mind. <laughs> That's very true. It's like the biggest misconception about interviews is that the interviewers are there to, you know, trip you and make you uh, fail. Like, no, <laughs> nobody <laughs> enjoys torturing a student. Nobody enjoys seeing a student fail. In fact, it, it's quite a big responsibility because, you know, this is a, a big chance that a person has to show what they've studied, what they know, and and you want everyone to have a very fair chance. And so that's why if you ever get stuck, you'll get hints and that's not, that doesn't disqualify you. You know, you even if you fail completely for one problem, that you could still do well in other problems. And, and we, we as interviewers know that. Okay, so are there any programs for PhD students and research in general? Absolutely. So uh, maths is a very intensive, research intensive area. And in fact, uh, even in the department, we have a huge number of graduate students. So we have a three year undergraduate degree. And then the fourth year is called part three in Cambridge. And it's, uh, it's a master's program and it's, it's very popular. So many people who do their undergraduate degrees in Cambridge stay on for part three and Kayla was one of them. Um, and also people come from other universities in the UK and also from abroad. So it's quite an international degree and there are, every year we have about 250 to 300 students in, in this program. And then there's also a very large PhD program in maths in the department and there's a, a great number of researchers in the department. And so that's, um, it's really a very research oriented um, uh, degree and something that makes uh, Cambridge very special too is the opportunity to do research as an undergraduate. So it's very common for students to do research projects in the summers and that allows you to explore uh, areas of maths that you've studied in your in your coursework in more detail or maybe you know venture slightly farther afield and maybe do a, an internship in a company or, or in um, in another department in the university, maybe you want to uh, apply your knowledge to biology or, or economics or some other area that you're interested in and the, the department facilitates that. Um, so um, can you get an offer for maths if you're, if you're predicted an A in further maths, but an A star in maths and another subject? Um, Yes, absolutely. I mean, that, that's not, that doesn't disqualify you at all. In fact, predicted A-level grades is not, they're not the most important factor in an application. We understand that uh, the predictions can be noisy. Uh, and so um, actually your GCSEs are much more important in determining your chance of getting an interview. And then the interview is also quite important in maths. Maths is very particular in Cambridge in that we have STEP. So for those of you who haven't heard of STEP, um, you, the way it works is you make your application to the university, then you get uh, an interview, a number of people who apply will be selected to interview. And then after the interview, you get a conditional offer, which is conditional on doing well in the STEP exam. And that happens uh, in your last uh, semester in school and um, and so that that what happened that allows us to make a lot more offers so actually unfortunately many people do not meet the conditions of the step exam but the, the, the good thing about that is that after the interview we can make offers to students who maybe don't look very good you know as good on paper maybe they don't have good predicted A-level a grades or maybe their GCSEs are not quite as strong, but maybe they showed some potential in the interview. So we can take, you know, risks on like that. And, and the step exam is another sort of selection process. And so it's quite a rigorous process, but the, the good thing is that if you, if there's one aspect of your application, which you don't think is very strong, you know, you still have a very good chance of getting an offer. Um, so would we miss out on the maths if we do a joint degree? Um, so 
I, I'm not quite sure what, what kind of degree you're thinking about. Um, I know other universities have degrees in like maths and industrial engineering or you know, maths and statistics. Um, like at Oxford, for example, has a degree in, in maths and statistics. Um, in Cambridge, we only, there's only a degree in maths and then you have the option of studying maths with physics. Um, and um, do you miss out on maths? I mean, I think invariably, what, even if you, have a, if you do a maths degree at some point in the third year, you specialize on some particular area of maths. And so, um, you know, very few people are able to <laughs> cover the entire breadth of mathematics. It's, it's hard not to miss out on something. Um, but um, generally the degree in Cambridge tends to be um, you, you get a good exposure to a number of pure topics that maybe if you if you would do a more applied degree in another university you don't get to see so um, it's a bit a bit difficult to answer that question I don't know if Kayla would have any thoughts on that yeah I think um if you like the idea of doing maths with something else, then sure, consider it. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what else to say apart from that. Yeah, I guess that the way to, you know, if you're, if you're unsure about what degree to, to study, the best way to do that is to read as much as you can about maths, try to find as many resources as you can. And, you know, that'll help you understand the difference of different, between different sub areas uh, or different degrees and make it'll help you make a more informed decision and uh, the, the only thing i might add is that if the reason that you'll think you're doing maths and something else is perhaps because you're worried you'll lose out on that skill set um by just studying maths i would say like don't worry so much because there is quite a bit of the year outside of your studies um to explore other interests um, so don't worry about just becoming a single-minded maths brain. <laughs> if you're interested in other things, that won't happen. And as you can see, you know, after Cambridge, you can do all sorts of things. Like Kayla is working in machine learning, right? And she did not study necessarily machine learning as an undergraduate, but she has the right brain to, to do that kind of thing. So, if we're asked a question at interview on a topic which we're unsure about, how would you suggest we handle that and try to make progress? Um, that's a, a good question. So if, if you're asked about something that you've never been exposed to before, so maybe you haven't studied integration yet and they're give, they give you an integration problem, it's perfectly okay to say, I haven't seen this before. I, I don't know how to do integrals yet. This is, um, you know, we study this next term. And that's very common actually for people from some of the developed nations, you know, like uh, people from who are coming from Wales or sometimes they do things in or Ireland, you know, like the, the, or even, you know, international students often they, they have, they start different topics at different times of the year. And so um, we are, interviewers are very aware of that and, and you are allowed to say, I, I don't know about this and you know there will be there will always be some other problem that they can give you um, if you're just unsure about how to progress on a specific problem it's something that you've seen before but maybe um, you know maybe you can try to explain to the interviewer you know what how you think you could tackle this you know even if it's a little vague and then they might give you a hint that will help you progress okay so um, the, the main thing to remember is interviewers are they're very experienced at, at handling this type of situation, so you shouldn't be anxious. Um, so how will interviews differ to normal years as a result of them being virtual this year? That's a very good question, and it's something that, honestly, we don't know very well either. Um, so the university has decided to uh, conduct all the interviews remotely, and um, every student will have some means of writing things down in a tablet. Um, and basically you will have some kind of digital device where you can write something down on the screen, sort of like what I was doing in my lecture today. And your interviewers will be able to write on the same screen. And, um, and you know, this will, this will be facilitated by 
the university. So if you don't ha currently have this device and you are invited to interview, um, you will get information about how this will work. And hopefully it'll be uh, well ahead of the interview so that you can prepare for the format, for the, the you know, the writing, the kind of writing implement that, you, that you'll be using. Um, and so I think, you know, necessarily when you're speaking over an, an internet connection, you know, that, that's a bit susceptible to um, interruptions. And, and I think that, that, you know, could delay an interview or maybe uh, you might have to take a break and continue. So you have to be prepared for eventualities like this. But fundamentally, the format of the interview will be um, similar to, to a normal year. Um, I should also say that every college um, has the, the freedom to do it, to arrange their interviews however they decide is best. And, and this year, you know, there might be some divergences between colleges. Um, but again, this, all the information will be provided by the college that you're interviewing with um, well before the interview. Um, um, I hope this answers your question. I don't know. Um, I think really beside the fact that we're writing, you know, an electronic device, um, I think the, the, inter the interaction will be very similar. I hope it'll be very similar. Um, so how, how many questions does an average candidate answer in an interview? Um, so that, that really depends on the type of question that is that they ask in the interview. Sometimes the question can have multiple parts and can be on the longer side, whereas other questions are very short and um, they can be done more quickly. Um, in, in the interviews that I do, normally students will go through three problems and then, you know, maybe a fourth one if they if they do well in the last one. Um, and but, you know, usually by the time you get to the last problem, you if you if you don't finish in order to finish the problem you have to give a, a pretty strong hint okay so that, that's sort of what you can expect in 25 minutes so each question will be sort of five to ten minutes um but that that varies by college so please you know be aware that that could uh that could be different in different colleges um can you get a master's in maths and then move on to do a robotics phd absolutely Robotics is an area that is very booming now. It's artificial intelligence and machine learning are, um, there's a great demand for, for PhD students in that area. And mathematicians are very desirable as PhD students in that area because they, they have a, a way of thinking that is, that is perhaps rarer than people who know about computer science and who can program really well. So, um, so absolutely, yes. Uh, even if we did well in maths at GCSE, should we have done relatively well in all our other subjects as well to have a chance of being accepted at Oxbridge? So um, usually the, it, it is more important to have done well in maths and related subjects like you know, physics or you know, science subjects. Um, normally the number of GCSEs is a good indicator of the potential that a student has. Um, but um, so it, it's hard to say, I mean, but, you know, just be another thing to, to say about GCSEs is we always look at your GCSEs relative to the, the, the typical GCSEs in your school. Okay, so um, there is some adjustment to be made, you know, we, we want to evaluate your potential and, you know, some schools uh, spend a lot of effort preparing students for the GCSE exams, others do not, and so it's also a factor that we consider. So it's, it's very, for many people often ask, you know, how many GCSEs at eight or nine grade do I need to be admitted into Cambridge? And it's very difficult to say, you know, there are people who get offers who have, you know, four G GCSEs at that level. There are people who have 10 or 11. You know. So it's, uh, there's quite a range. Um, are predicted grades more important for international students without GCSEs? Um, 
Yes, so if you are an international student uh, and you don't have GCSEs, then we'll be looking at your, your predicted grades. If you haven't done any kind of standardized exam, then I guess, I guess what we have to go by is your, your teacher's recommendations and any kind of predicted scores that you have. Um, so so I, in that sense, they, they are more important. And depending on the system that you're studying, um, in, there may be some guidelines. So if you're, for example, doing an international baccalaureate, there, there, in the admission site for Cambridge, you'll be able to find um, some equivalent uh, conditional offer. So the, you know, the offer for A levels, A, A, A star, A star, A, you know, there's an equivalent to that for IB and for other systems as well. Um, Okay, so we're getting to the, the end. So let, let's, let me see if I can, we only have four more open questions. Um, so somebody says, what optional A-level modules would you recommend of a further math student to take if they're thinking of applying for maths at Cambridge out of mechanics, statistics, and decisions? Um, I, I don't know if I would recommend one over the other necessarily. Uh, I didn't, I mean, in terms of improving your chances of admissions, um, I think whichever optional module you do, um, uh, it's more about preparing for interviews and eventually if you get an offer preparing for the step exam. Um, I don't know, Kayla, do you have any, any opinion about this? Um, no, so like my school didn't offer decision and I mainly focused on statistics, I preferred that. Um, there, are, there are some courses in the second term which um, require like, I think roughly M4 knowledge, but they offer an extra course in the first term for people who don't have that background to get up to speed. And when I did it, I found it was like very little of that module that you actually needed to so. A little of the mechanic yeah. module, okay. Yeah, so maybe mechanics is a maybe a bit more important to yeah, but it's the it's beginning of your course at Cambridge, but um, but in terms of admissions, I mean, I wouldn't say it has a, a big effect. Um, um, what is the teaching style like in Cambridge? So maybe that's something Kayla can can answer. Uh, yeah. So. Um, you have about, in your first year, you have about two lectures a day, six days a week, um, each for an hour in the morning. Um, and then you'll have also roughly two supervisions per week. And a supervision, as I mentioned, is this hour long session with um, one like professional mathematician, let's say, so a, a, a lecturer or a PhD student, um, and you and one other student. And you'll bring like a sheet of example like questions that the lecturer has supplied and that you've like answered in your own time, I guess the equivalent of homework at school. Um, and you'll like go through those problems, you'll maybe explore them a bit, for, like those ideas a bit further, um, or you'll get help with the bits that you've found difficult to understand. And generally your supervisor just gives you like another way of like understanding what you've gone through in your lectures. It's a, it's a very like personal and human experience. Um, some colleges also offer example classes. Um, I didn't have that, so I think um, Sergio will be able to tell you more about that. Um, but uh, that's overall it. And I think uh, the last thing I'd say is that the maths department really cares about how you find the teaching. So you, they'll ask for lots of feedback in order to improve the way that they do things as well. Um. So what was your thought process be behind choosing to study maths at university? Um, well, I actually didn't, I actually started studying chemistry at university and then I switched to maths in the second year. So I'm not a, a great example of that, but I always liked maths in, in school. I guess I erroneously thought that maths was too pure, too abstract for me when I was in school and that I, that I wanted to do something a bit more applicable. But then I found that, that it was actually very useful and, and fun to study at university level in a way that I didn't realize when I was in school. And so I, I kind of came to maths a bit later than, than most people. What, what would you say, Kayla? What was your experience like? Um, 
Um, so um, at this time in year 12, I was actually thinking of studying Russian or history at university. Um, but then <laughs> I got interested in um, economics because I really wanted to do like good things in the world. Um, and, but economics was a bit of a mess at the time because it was just after the financial crisis. And, math, and at the same time, I'd started reading these maths books and I found it all really interesting. Um, but I was worried that I'd need to be like a genius to study maths. And once I realized that wasn't the case, I was really happy to choose it. That's the short version. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so, okay, so let's conclude with the last two questions, which are about college choice. Um, so one is what college is, is seen as easier to get into? And someone would like to know what Kayla thinks about modeling college. That's a charged question. <laughs> so I should say Kayla was a student at Trinity College. Um, so maybe you, do, do you want to tackle that one? Uh, so yeah, um, I, I don't know much about Maudlin except uh, the supervisors who are there, that the buildings are quite nice, so I can't really say <laughs> any more about it than that. I think um, any college you go to is a different experience, not better or worse. I think that's the main thing uh, to say, and everyone really loves the college they go to by the end of it. So I loved Trinity. Uh, Murray Edwards people love Murray Edwards and Maudlin people love Maudlin. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there are differences, you know, the size mainly. So Trinity is a very big college. It's very big in math and very famous. But in terms of which colleges are seen as easy to get into, I would say probably not Trinity. <laughs> but um, I, I'm not supposed to say that, you know, we're supposed to say that there's, they're all the same. But actually Trinity gets a lot of applications because it is very well known for math. And, you know, there are ways of redistributing applications. So often if you apply to Trinity, maybe you'll be re re reallocated to another college that has gotten fewer applications. Um, but uh, so, you know, everyone, we try, there is someone who's looking at the strength of the field across different colleges and making sure that there are no disadvantages for having applied to a particular college. So we try to make the system uh, fair in that sense. So, you know, if you're thinking about which college to choose from, think about whether you want to be in a big college or a small college, whether you want to be in an old college or a newer college. Um, so Maudlin, for example, is a very small college. We have about five or six math students per year. And so it's a very tight knit community. I know all the math students at Maudlin and uh, I've supervised all of them. And so it's, it's more like a small family, whereas at Trinity you'll have you know, a lot of mathematicians and uh, it's more maybe more vibrant uh, but you know also bigger um, okay so I, I'm aware that we're we're past 6 30 so I think it's time to to stop um, uh, but uh, I want to thank both of our panelists and I'm sorry that Alexander today didn't have <laughs> I haven't called on him very much because uh, he's a he's, he studied modern languages and so um, but you know thank you very much for being here and for helping organize uh, today's event um, and thank you very much to Kayla for joining us uh, despite having left Cambridge behind <laughs> uh, some time ago uh, I, I'm sure everyone really appreciates uh, your your input as a student here I, I've never been a student at Cambridge so I wouldn't know um, Okay, so thank you all for, for joining and, um, and I hope you apply to Cambridge uh, next year if you're in year 12 or this year if you're in year 13. Um, and if, you're, if you're in year 12 and you are thinking about applying to Target Oxbridge, don't forget the deadline is the Sunday, the, it's Sunday the 1st of November. So um, make sure you get up in time. Yes. Big plug for Target Oxford, which is a excellent <laughs> program, and they really improve your chances of getting into, into Oxbridge. And um, so do apply, check it out. Um, okay, well, good night, everyone, and thank you very much for joining. Bye. Bye.